All right, everyone. Hello and happy new year. Uh, welcome back to our uh, ACS Astrochemonars um, hosted by the uh, Astrochemistry subdivision. Um, we have, uh, I'm really excited. We have a couple of uh, uh, exciting talks for you lined up today. Um, and before we get into those, uh, a couple of uh, very brief announcements. Uh, first off, we want to let everyone in the community know that uh, nomination period is open for the ACS Astrochemistry Dissertation Award. Um, and we especially want to make clear that we've revised uh, some of the guidelines and we have moved the uh, the deadline up. So the new submission deadline for um, uh, for ACS Astrochemistry uh, Dissertation Award is January 31st. It's the end of this month. And because we've changed the uh, the date, we've also revised slightly the eligibility uh, guidelines and some of the uh, the materials that go into the nomination packet. Uh, so. Um, so please take a look at those. A uh, link uh, should be available in the uh, the chat for you. Um, if you have someone who you'd like to nominate for the award, or if you're a graduate student or who has recent or a postdoc who's recently uh, submitted their thesis, um, if you, if you'd like to be uh, considered for this award, please check out the guidelines, um, and uh, we'd be happy to receive uh, your nominations. If you have applied in the past, you are um, and are still eligible. You will need to be uh, renominated. Uh, so again, please check our website for more information uh, about the the, the new uh, uh, the new guidelines. Uh, also, I want to um, just uh, put out there that we are looking for contributed talks for our upcoming astrochemonars. We uh, plan to have an astrochemonar next month in February. Um, we'll take a break in March for the uh, the spring ACS meeting, and then we have another one lined up for April. So we're uh, actively seeking contributed talks. Uh, if you are a graduate student or postdoc especially who's uh, interested in getting your work out in front of the community, uh, please do go to our, our website and there's a link there where you can uh, send us uh, your abstract and we'd love to get you on the schedule. Uh, so with that, uh, those are the announcements that we wanted to, uh, uh, to pass on to you all. Um, and so let's uh, move on to our first uh, talk of the day. Our first talk is going to be given by uh, Dr. Josh Marks. Uh, Josh uh, started out at the University of Hartford in Connecticut, where he did his undergraduate degree. And then after working in industry for a couple of years um, as an analytical chemist, uh, he did his PhD in physical chemistry at the University of Georgia under the supervision of uh, Professor Mike Duncan. Uh, he's now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Hawaii, uh, working under the supervision of uh, Dr. Ralph Kaiser. And so his uh, talk is about uh, the preparation of methane diamine um, as a potential precursor for nucleo bases in the ISM. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Dr. Marks. Thank you for the great introduction. I'm really excited to be able to pre present some research today about on our synthesis and for the first time detection of isolated methane diamine, a potential precursor to nucleo bases in the interstellar medium. So why are we interested in the means in an astrophysical environment? These are really important uh, molecules because they can undergo nucleophilic reactions, which don't require radical formation at very low temperatures. They've been reported down to 60 Kelvin, and they're an integral part of amino acids and therefore proteins and nucleobases. Uh, the technique that we use is called photoionization reflectron time of flight mass spectrometry. And at the end of the talk, I'll be talking about the astrophysical and astrobiological implications of our observation of this molecule. Uh, which was recently reported in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So this is a testament to how busy astronomers have been recently. These are all the molecules that have been observed in the interstellar medium that contain carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and possibly oxygen. And as you may notice, they are almost entirely nitriles or isonitriles. Uh, there are a very limited number of imines containing a carbon nitrogen double bond. And there are a similarly limited number of amines and amines don't count having very different chemistry than amines in at least condensed phase chemistry. So this is a very limited set from which we can draw conclusions about the formations of amines and their possible reactions in space. And one of the important applications of amines is their presence along with imines in purines and pyrimidines, the, the, one of the fundamental components of both RNA and DNA, all of these molecules are heterocyclic and contain the NCN uh, moiety inside that heterocyclic structure. And three of them are pyrimidine-based, which contains this subunit, which can be related to uh, methane diamine. 
Now, methane diamine itself is the simplest molecule to contain that NCN unit. And while the dihydrochloride salt is available, you can go buy it if you want to do some chemical synthesis with it. The free methane diamine in isolation or as a, uh, without mixture with anything is completely unknown in chemistry. Uh, it has, however, been of significant interest to the computational chemistry community because of its uh, as a model system exhibiting the generalized anomeric effect, which for reasons I don't want to discuss, uh, generally show a preference for the Gauche configuration for both of these bonds when a carbon has been substituted with two uh, electronegative substituents. So what do we think that this molecule might be able to do? It, Radical reactions, especially in an irradiated environment and molecular cloud and interstellar ices have been pretty uh, thoroughly explored and we have no reason to expect that they shouldn't apply to this molecule. But perhaps more interesting and less researched are low temperature nucleophilic addition and substitution reactions, where reaction four and five here are model reactions. Reaction six and seven are reported are straight from the literature and show that methane diamine uh, because of its difunctional nature, it can be used to produce heterocyclic structures and can even undergo uh, uh, desaturation during reaction to form conjugated pi systems, which are important for the production of nucleobases. The technique that we use to study these molecules is named photoionization reflectron time of flight mass spectrometry. Um, we begin by depositing an ice. In this case, we used ammonia and methylamine deposited onto a polished silver target mounted on a cold head at 5 Kelvin. And we deposit these two molecules through separate capillaries so they can form a mixture on the ice simultaneously. Uh, after we've deposited our ice, we use Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy to verify the composition of the ice that we've produced, generally aiming for a one-to-one -one mixture when we use a binary ice. And then while recording infrared spectra, we irradiate the ice using five KeV electrons, which simulate the effects of secondary electrons produced by the passage of cosmic rays through molecular clouds. Finally, once we've irradiated, irradiated the ice, we rotate the cold head to face the mass spectrometer and gradually raise the temperature, in this case at one Kelvin per minute, while passing a photoionization laser across the surface of the ice. So molecules that sublime from the ice that have an ionization energy less than the photon energy we're using for a particular experiment can be ionized and, subs and subsequently mass analyzed and detected by the mass spectrometer. To generate our vacuum ultraviolet light and these high energy photons, we use a technique called four wave mixing which produces VUV light that we can tune from about 6.2 to 11.1, and hopefully higher photon energies. And the importance of using single photon ionization is that it is a soft ionization technique and when used carefully does not produce fragmentation. For the experiments I'm discussing here, we use the difference frequency technique in xenon, which allows us to produce the relatively low energy photons necessary to study nitrogen substituted hydrocarbons, which do tend to have fairly low ionization energies. So for the reaction of methyl methylamine and ammonia and an irradiated ice, we begin with the production of radicals, which can react directly or possibly be frozen in the ice. This is just a subset of the possible radicals that we can produce, A through D. And then radical recombination, where two radicals join each other to form a new single bond, can conceivably produce the mass coincident or the isomers, methane diamine and two methyl hydrazine. Uh, and because these two molecules have very different ionization energies, we can fairly easily distinguish between the two using photoionization because the ionization energies for these molecules have not been measured with sufficient accuracy. In case of methane diamine, it hasn't been observed, so it couldn't be measured. We used high quality CCSD parentheses T C slash CBS, or complete basis set extrapolation uh, calculations to predict ionization energies provided by our collaborator, Ryan Fordenberry, the University of Mississippi. So armed with this knowledge, we begin our experiments. Um, we used photon energy in excess of both the predicted photon ionization and uh, photoionization energies. 
And we irradiated the ices. We used both isotopic substitution and changing the ionization energy. And the irradiation dose that we used for these experiments is what would be expected of a molecular, of what would be expected an ice should experience during 1% to 12% of the lifetime of your average molecular cloud. So relatively small considering the total accumulated lifetime dose that ices may experience. Now we detect initially two peaks, one at 120 Kelvin and one at 150 Kelvin for uh, the M over Z 46 mass channel. Uh, at 8 EV, neither of these peaks show up. So we have possibly two different molecules here, although they must have an ionization energy between 8 and 9.2 EV. Then we use isotopic substitution of the molecules that we use to produce our ice, which informs us that the higher temperature peak, which shifts according exactly how we would predict it to, if it were methane diamine or an isomer of it, must be methane diamine. And we do not detect methyl hydrazine uh, because its ionization energy is below 8 dB. So it should be visible right here in the red line if it were present. So now that we know that we've produced this molecule, uh, I'd like to discuss the computed structure in comparison to some isoelectronic species. Uh, we've previously published uh, the identification of amino methanol and methane diol in ices, or interstellar analog ices. And something I'd like to point out is that methane diamine in a violation of the generalized anomeric effect, which again, would predict a gauche configuration for both of the carbon-nitrogen bond internal rotation angles, uh, that we predict that the anti-anti or trans-trans configuration to be most stable, and which is a little bit surprising, especially in comparison to these two other isoelectronic species for which this is not the case. Furthermore, we can see evidence of steric strain here because the bond angle for the NCN angle compared to the OCN or OCO bond angle is significantly larger and is larger than, by about 10 degrees than the ideal tetrahedral bond angle of 109.5, showing that these amine groups, even though they're most stable in this configuration, do still experience some repulsion from one another. Now, what use could this molecule have? One of the recent detections that was on that enormous slide with Waldo hiding in it earlier, with all the detected molecules that are relevant to nitrogen. Uh, well, I suppose this one wasn't there because it doesn't have nitrogen in it, but 3-hydroxypropanol was observed last year and reported in the literature in a protocellular environment. This is the same environment that could produce the temperatures necessary for the sublimation of methane diamine. And because we've already seen in the literature, in the cap, the organic synthesis literature that substitution uh, between this molecule and both aldehydes and alcohols is possible. Uh, we predict that there is a fairly convenient reaction that could produce an intermediate by addition of methane diamine to 3-hydroxypropanol and then subsequent uh, desaturation by loss of hydrogen and ice in an irradiated environment could quite readily produce pyrimidine. Now, I'd like to take a moment to uh, uh, promote our ongoing collaboration of ours with the National Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory in Hefei, China, uh, where we are implementing the technique that we use to produce uh, in combination with a synchrotron light source, which allows us to measure uh, photoelectron or photoionization efficiency spectra as seen here during a single temperature program desorption experiment which can aid in both the uh, speed and quality of the assignments that we can make using these techniques. And finally, I'd like to thank my, co my co-worker, Dr. Jia Wong, and my PI, Dr. Balf Kaiser, and our collaborator, Brian Fordenberry, who did some wonderful computational work for us. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Josh for that very nice talk. Um, so again, I, I posted in the chat a moment ago, if you have questions uh, for uh, Joshua, please uh, open up the Q&A tab and you can uh, submit your uh, question there. We'll, uh, we'll get to it as soon as we can. Uh, so to start things off, uh, what I, I guess I, I will 
take the liberty of asking the first question. And, and what I want to know is, um, are there particular um, astronomical observations that would be helpful in allowing you to determine whether this chemistry that you are exploring in ices is actually operative in a particular astronomical environment? I'm not at the moment aware of any particular observations. Uh, the possible thermal reactions that I discussed there have not been as thoroughly explored as possible radical reactions, and they definitely haven't been observed with um, techniques as sensitive as what we're using here. A lot of the research into these nucleophilic reactions has taken place using um, quadrupole mass spectrometry which because of the substitution with highly electronegative groups tends to fragment these molecules very effectively or infrared spectroscopy, which is a much, much higher detection threshold or lower, depending on how you look at it. It's much less sensitive than photoionization. So we're hoping to be able to uh, piggyback off of this research to study some possible thermal reactions and observe and look for other possible products that would be candidates for detection. Yeah, that was actually going to be my follow up question is what are what are some of the, the subsequent uh, subsequent potential detectable products that may come out of this kind of chemistry that we should be interested in. And is there are, oh. there, are there are there particular targets that need uh, like rotational characterization. I think there are a lot of them out there, uh, simply because of the low temperature at which. Uh, nucleophilic addition reactions can take place at, for example, uh, carbamic acid, the result of addition of ammonia to CO2, has been reported as low as 60 Kelvin. Um, so there are, and similar reactions can proceed between ammonia or methylamine, both of which are known, and um, aldehydes, almost any aldehyde or ketone, depending on steric restriction. Um, and some alcohols. Okay, so we have a question that's come in the chat. Um, uh, Ernest Gargas is asking, are, the, are these reactions also found in other stellar cloud formations? Do you see these types of reactions in different stages of cloud and or star formation? I am not certain about the current state of the observation of all of the possible molecules that we could observe. Uh, but one of the things that I would point out is that the molecules that we have observed in the interstellar medium tend to tend strongly to have uh, nitrogen in a terminal position. Um, like I showed earlier, most of these molecules that we can see on screen right now contain nitriles or isonitriles. So the molecules that could conceivably have this structure in it have uh, only terminal nitrogens. So I think that this is something that looking forward, I expect these to be uh, structures that we can observe a little bit more of in the future. And the only exception that I can see here on this table is the um, methyl carbamic acid right there. All right, and uh, an another question uh, from uh, Alberto um, uh, Masario Farto is, uh, hi, nice talk. Maybe I missed this, but how, uh, how can you know that the confirmer that you uh, pointed at is the right one that you're observing experimentally. I'm afraid that we can't distinguish between the possible confirmers using this for this particular molecule using our technique because we're limited by distinguishing between different molecules based on their sublimation temperature and ionization energy. If those are not sufficiently different, uh, we cannot tell the difference. Here we computationally. Um, report that the anti-anti configuration is several kilojoules per mole more stable than the other confirmers. Although the ionization energy for these uh, three structures are close enough to be identical given our margin of error. All right, and uh, Catherine Walker asks, uh, you mentioned the stability of different confirmers of methane diamine a few times. Do you know what impact uh, the different confirmers might have on the ice chemistry? Uh, I can, off, I can offer some speculation on this point. The um, reason that these conformers have different energies and why we surprisingly find that the structure with steric strain is the most stable is because there is 
and I'm gonna use a word a lot of us have dreaded since taking organic chemistry, hyperconjugation, and God forbid, negative hyperconjugation. Uh, so the exposure of the nitrogen, nitrogen on non-bonding electrons changes pretty significantly between these different contramers because of interactions with the CH bonds. Um, so I would expect there to be some, although possibly small difference between them because the amount to which the uh, non-bonding pair can participate in both hyperconjugation and nucleophilic addition may affect its ability to do one or the other. All right, well, we're coming up to the end of our time for Q&A. Uh, however, Josh is going to stick around. And so if uh, if your question has not been answered yet, you can continue to put them either in the Q&A or the chat and uh, Josh can uh, can type in some answers or continue the discussion uh, as we move on to our next talk. So thank you again, uh, Josh. And our uh, second talk today is going to be given by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mike McCarthy. Uh, Mike did his PhD uh, at MIT under the supervision of Dr. Bob Field, and uh, since that time has uh, been at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where he has led a, a very uh, productive uh, research program focused on the rotational characterization of a number of reactive molecules of atmospheric and, uh, and astronomical interest. And these include things such as uh, the rotational characterization of some of the first uh, anions that were characterized in the interstellar medium, along with uh, many other uh, exotic molecules. Um, his, uh, he's currently the, uh, the, um, the Associate Director for Atomic and Molecular Physics at uh, the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and uh, since 2020 has been uh, the Deputy Director. Uh, so he's going to tell us today about uh, using uh, some of the tools that his group has developed over the years to study uh, complex mixtures in space and the laboratory. So with that, Mike, I'll hand the things over to you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, everyone can hear me okay, I hope? If not, I can hear you great. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thanks so much to the ACS uh, Astrochemistry Subdivision for the invitation to tell you about some of the work that's uh, going on today. And uh, also want to thank Josh for uh, his talk, which was really, uh, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, it's good to see that, that there are a lot of young people working in the field and doing great science. So as uh, you see here, the talk is uh, on extreme complex mixture analysis in the laboratory in space. When I actually first got the invitation, I have to acknowledge, I thought I was actually had the whole hour and I was excited because we have a lot of really exciting results. Um, people, some of you know, Peter uh, or Brian Changala, who's a postdoc in my lab, and he has made some amazing laboratory discoveries on metal dicarbides. We've now found these in IRC plus 216. In fact, these are some of the strongest unidentified lines in that source. He's also done some amazing work on propargyl radical and phenyl radical, really some wonderful work. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna talk about any of that, um, but hopefully you'll invite him back or me back and, and uh, we can tell you more about that. But this is, this what I'm gonna talk about today is really a culmination of actually a number of years of effort uh, by uh, people in my group um, and really trying to understand at a very high level an exhaustive analysis of uh, complex mixtures by microwave spectroscopy. So the motivation for this work, of course, is driven by astronomy. So as you see um, in the upper left-hand corner is a optical image. This is taken with a camera as you point in the northern sky at night. And if you have a uh, correct for the location of the earth, you can take these beautiful images of uh, stars in the northern hemisphere. And what's shown here is a portion of that sky where there's a region which is fairly dark, and of course, and that's because this is a molecular cloud, right? And so I, as some people know, I'm not an astronomer. I actually don't know where any constellations are in the sky at all. So I've shown you in, in, in green here where the Taurus constellation is, and this is a molecular cloud in this dashed region. And in, in that very large molecular cloud, which consists of mostly uh, molecular hydrogen, there's a source that's been known for many years called TMC1, Taurus molecular cloud. Um, and in this source, in fact, we know there's a rich chemistry of unusual molecules. So if we point a telescope, and there's any number of telescopes we could use, uh, the one that we've been using recently is this 100 meter dish in Green Bank, West Virginia. This picture really doesn't do justice to the size, scale, and scope of this amazing facility. This is the largest durable object on Earth. 
It's 100 meters from one side of the telescope to the other. And you see down below are, in some cases, um, very large uh, vehicles that look tiny on the, on the size of this, this image. But this, in fact, is uh, really just a huge instrument. If you have a chance to go visit it, I, I very strongly encourage you to do so. So what happens is when we point this telescope or other telescopes over or towards TMC1, this is just a very small portion of the spectrum that we observe. So this is a region around 25, 22 gigahertz showing you what the spectrum looks like. It's extremely sparse, but it's dominated at least in this spectrum by a single feature. And we know the carrier of that feature because we have laboratory spectroscopy. Uh, and it's not only a unusual molecule, it's actually a rare isotopic species of an unusual molecule. So it's actually CCS radical, and it's a 34 isotopic species, which on Earth, sulfur-34 is about 5% the natural abundance of, uh, of sulfur-32. So it's a weak um, isotopic species, but we can observe it with actually very high signal to noise. And again, this is suggestive just how uh, unusual the chemistry is in the source and how sharp the lines are. As a further illustration of the sharpness of the lines, this is a line width comparison in which I've overlaid an astronomical spectrum with a laboratory spectrum of the, in this case, the fundamental transition of cyanocetylene HC3N. So at very high spectral resolution, of course, it consists of three hyperfine components with a characteristic three to five to one intensity ratio, because of course we have a nitrogen with a spin of one, and that's what gives rise to the splitting. And in fact, there's a spectrum in red and a spectrum in black. And if I asked you which one was which, most people would probably guess, well, of course, what you measure in the laboratory can be, um, is often much sharper. And in fact, this is the opposite. In red is the astronomical spectrum, and in black is a chirp spectrum, uh, which is recorded. And as you see, uh, for the fundamental transition, the chirp spectrum is about a factor of 20, um, poor resolution that what we can observe in TMC1. So that's what's telling us is this is a very quiescent source. There's very little turbulence and these lines are absolutely razor sharp. So we have a fingerprint that we can use to compare the laboratory and astronomical data and ultimately very, be very confident of the identifications. So in blue, in fact, is a chirp spectrum. We have this characteristic double peak line shape due to the instrumental nature of how we do the experiment. And it's the rest frequencies or the average of these two horns that give us the rest frequency. And that's what allows us, again, a very, very high resolution, a part per million or a tenth of a part per million to be very confident that these unusual molecules exist, in this case in TMC1 and in other sources uh, as well. All right, so what do we know about TMC1? Well, we know it's been known for many, many years to be this amazing source for mostly long carbon uh, chains, highly unsaturated carbon chains. And as Josh was mentioning, we see CN, uh, the nitrile functional unit being um, very, very conspicuous. So this is a portion of the spectrum with the GBT telescope, and you see it's completely dominated by these cyanopolyines, right? And many of them are, are off scale on the, on the image here. They go way off scale. Um, we have HC5N, HC7N, HC3N isotopic species. And in general, what this chemistry has led or we've concluded from this, and there are many uh, course modeling predictions that support this, that this points to the in importance of barrierless radical reactions in this source. Now, again, we're at very low temperature, um, less than 10 Kelvin, and very, 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 very low density. So only binary collisions occur, all right? In fact, this was actually the original motivation of Curl. He had the idea, he was obviously one of the people who measured laboratory spectrum of these molecules many years ago, found them in TMC1 with collaborators and had the idea that long carbon chains were the carriers of the fused interstellar bands. Um, obviously he got sidetracked when he discovered C60. Um, and that's of course now really the, the, gener the progenitor for what we now know to be um, modern uh, material science. And of course we now know that C60 is in, in, in space as well. Um, but nevertheless, that was the motivation for the work. So again, mostly these long carbon chain molecules. And so shown here is in fact uh, a view graph of the molecules that have been found in TMC1 up to just a few years ago. And you see there's these carbon chains, there's various gaps, there's a cumulative total shown here. And we, we knew as of about 2018, there are about yeah, 30, 35 molecules in the source. It was thought conventional wisdom. It was a well-understood source again, consisting of these highly unsaturated carbon chains, 
but certainly nothing more complicated, nothing, no complex chemistry as an organic chemist would define it, which would be aromatic chemistry. Um, and there was really not reason, much more reason to look at the source because it had this fairly simple but unusual chemistry, which had been studied over the years. That was, uh, that view, however, changed radically with the detection uh, of cyanobenzene, the simplest aromatic cyanide, uh, in this source about four, four and a half years ago. And these shown here are, at the time, three or four lines of TM, in TMC1 showing you uh, a comparison or overlay with laboratory spectrum. And ultimately, we've now detected not four lines, but well over uh, close to 20 different rotational lines of cyanobenzene in TMC1. Uh, this has been possible by obviously very sensitive receivers, large collection area of the TMC1 and a uh, uh, GBT telescope. And you can do a spectral stacking, which is just, again, taking the fact that you know the spectrum very accurately, taking little snipp snippets of the spectrum that you measure and overlapping them. Um, and you get a much higher signal to noise detection. And of course, what this means is what we've done is we functionalize benzene. It's well known through experiments, through calculations that the reaction between benzene and CN radical is both exothermic and barrierless. So the existence of cyanobenzene implies very, very, very strongly that benzene exists. And we're simply tagging it and imparting it with a very large dipole moment going from, of course, something that's not polar at all to something with a dipole moment of about 4.5 to 5, which makes it much easier to observe. All right, so then the question is, well, that's fantastic. That That is... Um, Totally unexpected, arguably, uh, but is it the end or the beginning? Uh, in the sense that, is, is this just one molecule or is this suggested there's a much larger organic chemistry lurking just below the surface uh, of previous observations, of previous surveys, that with better sensitivity, deeper integrations, larger telescopes, we can actually reveal. Uh, and the reason we were excited, excited about that is because um, it's well known in the pH literature that the bottleneck to aromatic molecule formation, much larger pHs, is actually formation of the first aromatic ring, which is thought to be benzene or something very close to it. And so this, in fact, spawned two very large astronomical surveys, Gotham, which I and others here um, are involved in, and the European line survey called Quotient, run by Pepe Chinacharo and, and others. And what has happened in the last few years is truly amazing. More than 40 new molecules have been detected in TMC1 uh, by these two teams. And most notably is it's, we've detected other aromatic ring molecules, right? We've detected five-membered rings that are functionalized, naphthalene that's been functionalized, even indine, which of course is a uh, slightly polar um, uh, bicyclic hydrocarbon, all right? And what's Amazing about that is that when we look, we derive the column density, we our models are off by several orders, multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, they're under predicting the existence of these aromatic species. So in fact, we've gone very quickly from a period of not having complex organic chemistry as defined by an organic chemist to now seeing ring molecules in a source that's thought to be a very primordial gas cloud. The question then becomes, well, how did these molecules form? Were they formed in there? Were they transported? Many, many, many open questions. And in fact, really re-examining a source which we thought to be very well understood. So that transitions then to laboratory spectroscopy, right? So obviously in space, we have a source like TMC1 where we see all sorts of different molecules. It's a very complex uh, uh, mixture of, of species, both stable and reactive ones. Um, and so what is the role in, in laboratory spectroscopy in, in supporting these astronomical observations? So I would argue there's two basic approaches to molecular discovery at centimeter wave, wave, wavelengths. One is widely used historically, and that's what I call focus spectroscopy. That's the idea is that you come into the lab and your goal is to identify a specific new molecule, typically as a result of a calculation, um, you have a good calculation, maybe you have a CCSD with parentheses T, high level of theory, large basis set. If, if it's a well, a fairly simple structure, closed shell, you can maybe be able to, um, in fact, predict its rotational transitions to a tenth of a percent, 10 megahertz at 10 gigahertz. 
with a cavity spectrometer, that's a very modest survey. And you ultimately do various experiments and um, ultimately detect lines and eliminate all lines that don't meet that model, right? And then by doing a series of measurements, for example, maybe the lines are magnetic and there are some lines in the spectrum that are not magnetic, right? So you can systematically remove, um, reduce div div different assays to determine if any of the lines meet the criteria. And ultimately this process, if it's successful, leads to the identification of this specific new isomer or, or molecule. The disadvantage of this approach is we ignore everything else that doesn't meet the criteria we're looking for. All right, so we're looking at, again, fairly narrow. The other version of this is unbiased spectroscopy, right? And that is ultimately driven by the, the, the development of CHIRP spectroscopy by Brooks Pate and his group, in which we're now gonna optimize the chemistry on a specific molecule or under specific conditions. We're gonna then do deep searches or deep uh, measurements that cover many, many gigahertz. And we're gonna ultimately achieve um, detections of many, many lines. The disadvantage here, however, is we have all this information, but potentially very little knowledge because we have to have a way of understanding how these lines are connected, what the carriers of these molecules are. And so this is really um, challenging in the case of astronomical molecules, as many of you are aware, because of course there are no clean, clean synthetic approaches for nearly all astronomical molecules, right? These are isomers, they're, they could be radicals, they could be high energy isomers. They're not things you, you buy from Aldrich. Right, so we're, and we're also, the only way to generate them is generally non-specific production techniques, electrical discharge, laser ablation, pyrolysis, which produce many, many other molecules um, that you're not interested in, and often they're present in much higher abundance. So the fundamental question we want to try to answer, is it really too audacious to assign every single feature in a wideband spectrum, when we know, in fact, very little about what might be produced. So I would argue this is ultimately a problem in complex mixture analysis and information theory. And that's what we ultimately are setting out to do is, is assign everything we can in a uh, complex mixture. And so we're gonna use, the way we approach this problem is to use two techniques, which I've already alluded to, which are cavity and chirp spectroscopy, spectroscopy, and use them, the strengths of both of them in a complementary fashion. And you can see on the right here are the properties of the chirped and, and cavity uh, techniques. Obviously we have a much wider bandwidth, lower sensitivity and, and less, and, and uh, lines aren't as sharp in chirp spectroscopy compared, compared to cavity spectroscopy. Um, but we can use these two in both techniques to our advantage. And that's what we're gonna do here. So this is the workflow. Again, this is, this is there are a lot of people who worked very hard over the years to try to get to this point. But the idea of the workflow is we're gonna acquire a chirp spectrum under a given set of conditions. As necessary, we may subcategorize those lines. For example, we're generally not interested in lines that are discharge related. Things may be magnetic. They may be dependent upon one or more precursors. That allows us to subdivide the lines into different categories. We ultimately then are going to assign and anal analyze and assign the lines. And we'll use a technique called PySpec tools, which is just a way of comparing what we measure to a catalog spectrum of a that's of a molecule that's, whose rotational spectrum has previously been measured. Anything that's left out that we can assign, we're going to do what we call AMDOR, which is basically uh, automated double resonance spectroscopy, and which we are going to connect lines quantum mechanically to each other. And ultimately, if we have enough of those quantum chemical or quantum mechanical connections, by absolute brute force, we can determine the rotational constants. And then we can then go back and remove them and continue this process again. Even though we're removing them, we then have to actually assign them, right? And this then becomes a process, again, of large databases, good, good quality calculations and comparing our rotational constants to these databases and being able to make assignments. And that's what we, that's, that's the process we're gonna walk through. So this is as an example of what we're hoping to accomplish. This is a test system, so to speak. This is the chirp spectrum of benzene, benzene O2 and benzene N2 in the center module band. This is a single measurement done from about six to 20 gigahertz of a discharge of benzene, which we peaked up on full beam, um, benzene O2 and benzene N2. And you see there's about 500 peaks, 1200 peaks and about a thousand peaks after 10 hours of deep integration in the center module band, all right? 
Now, the spectrum may look kind of complicated, right? It may look congested, but in fact, the filling factor is very, very low. And what I mean by that is the lines are 100 times sharper than what is shown on the screen. So even though lines look blended here, they're actually uh, very far from each other in terms of the resolution element. So again, we, we picked up on full beam. This is just a simple illustration. We take a portion of the spectrum, but one gigahertz wide portion of the spectrum. If I blow it up for you, you now can see lines aren't perhaps so, so close together. We'll then pick up on a fairly small region, arguably the, the most congested part of this spectrum between 13 and 14 gigahertz. I'll blow it up again. And you now can see the, the line width, the actual line width that we're working against in this experiment. But the point here is the filling factor is 1%. That is to say, out of every 100 resolution elements, only one, one has emission. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to then take that information and we can use our cavity experiment uh, to, to be much more efficient. We don't have to spend our time looking in here for a feature when we know the feature is here, here, and here. So it becomes much, much more efficient to do this exhaustive analysis. Right. So what can we do? Well, the first thing we want to do, obviously, is try to assign everything that we can in the spectrum, right? So in the top, this is just the benzene spectrum shown here in the top, and there are two panels below it. The first is what we measure. The second is when we use CDMS or, or GPL and remove lines that are present in those catalogs. And as you see here, it is only modestly successful. Um, we can we can roughly get rid of about 15% of lines and 15% of the intensity, and everything else is still uh, formally unassigned. We then can step it up a little bit more and remove things, obvious things that we uh, know exist in the literature that might not be in these catalogs, but which we have measured previously. That is, again, only marginally successful. About 60% or 70% of the lines are still unassigned and an equal amount of the intensity is unaccounted for, okay? And the things that we do account for are the usual suspects, right? We're running a benzene discharge. We have the various carbon chain radicals. We have fulvine, which we optimized on, right? Uh, orthobenzyne and some of these methyl acetylene metal and, and longer uh, uh, chain species. And of course, some of them are known in space, not surprisingly. So we are, we are in fact under these conditions producing molecules which are known astronomically. Okay, so again, to talk a little bit more about how we do this, this is the first step in the process is PySpec tools. This was created by a former postdoc, uh, Calvin Lee, who's now uh, moved on to a permanent position at Intel, uh, but he developed this open source Python 3 package for spectral analysis. If you haven't used it, I, it's available on, on GitHub. Uh, the idea is it's object oriented, it's automated, it's reproducible. You feed it in the spectrum, and then you can develop this workflow and you can go back to it a day later. You can share it with your colleagues as you work through the analysis. So it's a way of really a very, very good bookkeeping process and allows you interactively to, um, to analyze the data. All right. The key in ultimately identifying uh, many new molecules in these experiments is binary double resonance experiments, right? So the idea here, not surprisingly, is we want to link transitions to the same carrier. So we can get a double resonance effect occurs only when the two lines have a common upper or lower state. And this is easy to do in the microwave band, right? Optically, this is much, much harder. Microwave power is very inexpensive. You can ultimately get 100% depletions by typically destroying the coherence. It's very simply implemented. Basically, you don't even have to try very hard. You can just uh, use a second radiation source. And if you get it about right, you'll get plenty of overlap in the active volume of your experiment. And this is what's what's happening, where we're literally shooting in about every two seconds a microwave radiation that's sequentially tuned to different frequencies. And we're simply doing a binary experiment. Does the line or does the intensity of line change when this second radiation source is present? And so shown on the right here is literally how quickly we do this. So a typical line we could observe with good signal to noise at two seconds, and we literally step through. And a DR match occurs when we bleach the signal and therefore telling us that we have the two lines come from the same carrier and they are quantum mechanically connected. All right, so this is another illustration of that point. I should do, when we do the experiments, they're not color coded so nicely here, but this is the idea is that you start with one, in this case, unassigned line and you start pinging it with every other uh, frequency 
in the spectrum, which is unassigned. And you're literally looking for uh, a missing tooth in the comb, so to speak, right? So here we have a double resonance hit. We're stepping through and the line is bleached out. It tells us we have a small number of possibilities. And as we build this up, we then can assign lines, right? Same is true here, same is true here. Again, we're missing one or more teeth in, in a long comb of measurements. Okay, what happens is this is a really a neat program developed by another postdoc, Brandon Carroll, in the group in which we ultimately, by brute force, once we have more than three or four re double resonance hits, we can ultimately find a unique combination of rotational constants, which must have, which must be responsible for these connected uh, transitions. And so this is just a plot here showing you where we pre-compute the eigenvalues versus kappa, we interpolate. It's about 400 times faster than other methods. And you literally can do this uh, on a laptop in 20 or 30 minutes or less. And as, as the number of double resonance linkages grows, the number of unique identifications dramatically increases. All right, so we can actually figure out without any assumption as to whether or not there's a, the two transitions connected, you know, were, were, were shared upper state or lower state, whether it's linked and, and what it doesn't make any difference. We ultimately can get the assignments and we can get the rotational constants by this method. We have enough linkages. Okay, and this, this is just a plot showing you the advantage of this approach, of course, if you have a polar molecule is we're not, it's completely unbiased, I would argue. We are, we are just by brute force looking to see how things are connected. So we're not looking for simple signatures. We're not looking for any signature at all. It allows us to see molecules, to identify molecules which are very oblate and which are uh, uh, deviate significantly. They're not, they're not planar molecules. This is a plot shown here on the left of the interstellar molecules as a function of the non hydrogen atoms, uh, where we are between the prolate and, and oblate limit. And as you see, most molecules, with a few exceptions, where we've added our recently detected ones, are almost all linear chains because that has a simple harmonic progression. This is an example of laboratory molecules. Now, where we're showing you, um, it's not the number of atoms, of the heavy atoms. It's kappa here, so we're seeing things that deviate significantly from the, the kind of the linear chain limit, much more toward the oblate limit. And we're seeing things that, in fact, are typically very far from planar as well. So it allows us to see a whole range of species that we would not easily be able to, to assign or detect by any simple pattern rec rec recognition techniques. All right, so what we do is we do all these measurements, right? We do one cavity measurement, or, or I'm sorry, one trip measurement, small number of trip measurements, and then we pound away on the resulting spectrum for a, a period of time. We did, I think, about 600,000 individual cavity measurements. All right, so again, to remind you, this is a spectrum, benzene, benzene O2, and benzene N2, chirp spectrum, and now we're gonna systematically remove all of the lines that we've assigned. And we go from this picture to this picture. Again, going back, this picture, we've assigned essentially not everything, but nearly everything in the, all three spectra. Okay, if I blow it up for you by effect, again, the signal to noise on the left here, nothing, nothing but with high signal to noise is, is everything with high signal to noise is now assigned. If I blow it up by a factor of 20 or more, you see now in benzene, there's only a few weak features that remain unassigned, a few more in, in the benzene O2, the benzene N2. In terms of actually just uh, a summary, this is a summary of everything that we have uh, measured, shows you the three discharges, shows you the number of features found, the fraction that are unassigned presently. Again, we're using a threshold of about six to one after 10 hours of integration. So these are very weak lines here, typically that we are unable to assign. The number that are, you see that the number of, of assigned features is about 80, 80, high 80s typically. Um, so we're assigning nine of every 10 features. In terms of intensity, we're doing even better. We're assigning about 96 or so percent of every feature of all the features in the spectrum. How many species have we found? You see, if you take the richest source, we've now, we've now found in this 16, uh, six to 19 gigahertz region, 130 different species different distinct chemical species. If you add in vibrationally excited states, you add in isotopic species, the number jumps to 167 in this case. All right, so that's again, a testimony just to how rich these discharges are. 
the types of molecules that are produced. And similarly, we see for nitrogen, um, we get large numbers as well, close to 100 unique molecules and 130 isotopic species. Benzene, of course, is not as polar, and the possibilities are more limited, but nevertheless, um, 60, 70, 80 species are found. All right, but now what I didn't tell you yet uh, is actually how we make these assignments. So again, we what we do, we have a Python package and we uh, did some higher uh, calculations where we looked at different beta data, 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 uh, basis sets and levels of theory. We found an optimal level of performance. We benchmarked it. And then we literally, by brute force, again, calculate hundreds of thousands of compounds. And we simply query the database in comparison to the rotational constant that we have measured in the laboratory. We want, in this case, the 10 closest um, example, uh, 10 closest molecules based on, a, on an average error. And you see, in fact, as shown in green here, it's very clear that the this molecule, structure 16514, is in fact exactly the carrier of, of this particular the molecule that has this particular set of rotational constants. And we can do as necessary isotopic measurements to confirm it. So that's how we ultimately convert rotational constants to a, to a specific structure, specific elemental composition. All right, so just a quick summary of the types of things we find. We find fragments, we find isomers, we find larger species. This is just a few of the molecules that we found here. These are all calculations in terms of the dipole moment. Uh, just to show you how it compares to benzene itself, uh, we typically, um, we see molecules that are larger, we see molecules that are smaller um, than benzene. So all these different types of reactions are occurring. Things are being, um, insertion reactions occur uh, as well as fragmentation, right? I could show you pages and pages because there's so many for oxygen. These are just a, a small number of species that we found, some of which are well-known, uh, many of which are different unusual ring molecules. And now we have the rotational spectrum, very precisely measured. And the same could be done for nitrogen bearing. We have, again, these molecules now have been found in TMC1, uh, as has have many other uh, molecules uh, that are shown here. Uh, I think the supplement to our paper, I think is over close to 400 pages, uh, giving all these molecules and the rotational constants. You can again make lots and lots of plots. This is this just again for each of the diff discharges. You can plot the signal to noise, what molecules or what specific species uh, variants are giving rise to the intensity, the, the number of lines. So in benzene, phenyl uh, acetylene is giving rise to about ten percent of the lines. And you can you can make all sorts of plots of this out. We haven't assigned every molecule. We've assigned a lot of them, but these are a few that we have not been able to assign yet. And we're still working on these. Again, these are things where delta, right? A measure of planarity is very, many of them is very far from, from a prolate limit. I'm sorry, from, from a planar structure. And many of them are also somewhere in this transition region, closer to oblate than they are to uh, prolate. And at least one of them is, is chiral. Another neat aspect of this, of course, it's very complementary microwave spectro to, to um, mass spectroscopy, right? Because what we're allowed to do, what we're able to do with at high resolution is ex exquisite isomer resolution. So this is a plot, you may not be able to see it so well, but there's actually for each mass, this is the typical plot that you see, the dominant, um, you can ultimately invert the problem, we know the abundances, and therefore we can create these uh, mass spectra, you know, essentially synth synthetic mass spectra. If I show you the log of the abundance, it becomes much easier because you can now see that each line actually consists of multiple segments, which in which the segment is ind indicative of the abundance. So it's just a final example. This is the C4H5N isomers. There are seven isomeric forms that we can separate out spectroscopically, and you see the relative abundance of each of these. All right, so this is again, a complementary technique to mass spectroscopy where we have such high resolution that we, we don't need to worry about, um, well, conformers and, and small changes in structure are easily resolved at the at radio wavelengths. All right, so very high level, I didn't need to finish up here. Benzene specific results, we have over 3000 features. We've assigned 90% of these, roughly 90% of the intensity. We found lots of different 
distinct chemical species, lots of their variants. Many of them are entirely new. They haven't been measured by rotational spectroscopy. I didn't talk about it much, but most of the time, the heteratom, the oxygen, and the nitrogen is terminal to the chain or to the ring. Um, sample purity becomes absolutely paramount in these experiments because even low level contamination can drive a very rich secondary chemistry. So things like water, um, obviously any air, which is nitrogen, oxygen can really drive chemistry. So you have to be very, very careful that even though you didn't add it, it may be giving rise to the many features that you observe. Species, species heavier than benzene are common and conspicuous. And in particular, ring chains are really very abundant and they may therefore uh, be prominent in terms of the pathway to pH one. General conclusions, I didn't talk about it that much, but obviously the, the, the existence now is small aromatic rings in the ISM has at least been partially resolved. These were present all along. They were just slightly below the detection sensitivity of previous surveys. Lots of follow-up experiments, measurements, and observations are happening. It's unusual and unexpected that we would find these aromatic molecules in what is widely thought to be a very primordial gas cloud, and we have many more questions and answers. I hope I've shown you from the laboratory work that microwave spectroscopy is an exquisite and precision tool for complex mixture analysis. We don't have to know the spectrum in advance, right? We can actually, by bootstrapping, actually identify molecules de novo. It has a lot of uh, complementary nature to mass spectroscopy. And it, I think it's ultimately telling us there's so much discovery space that exists, provided we have the analysis tools in place and that we really need further automation to make this even more efficient. So a lot of people were involved in this work, one of whom uh, as, as uh, introduced me, and that's Kyle. He was really a tremendous in terms of uh, a lot of the software that we still use um, and was a really fantastic uh, postdoc. We have Calvin Lee, um, who did a lot of the Python analysis, Brandon Carroll, who did uh, the high-speed fitting algorithm, and Maria Lean, who's been uh, really instrumental in many, many aspects of, of this effort uh, as well. And so I want to thank NSF, NASA, very much for their, their uh, support over the years. And thank you very much for your attention. So I think I'm out of time. All right, uh, thanks, Mike. It's really nice to see a lot of the, the progress that you all have made since the time I was a postdoc with you. Um, I'm going to open up the questions. We have a question from uh, uh, Steve Shipman who asks, uh, who comments first that the automated uh, double resonance work is really excellent. excellent. And uh, they were wondering how much of a pain it would be to automatically go back and look at some of your hits at different microwave power levels uh, and whether that would be a way to get loose dipole moment estimates uh, based on how much power you need to saturate and potentially put some dipole moment constraints on unidentified species. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. We, we, um, we do have the ability to estimate very roughly the dipole moment by doing exactly what Steve suggests. Um, Indeed, we can, that's one of the way I, I didn't explicitly say, but that's actually one of the ways that we check the identifications is that if you have a calculation of the structure and it says, you know, for example, the molecule should have a, you know, a good size B moment, then we should be able to measure those, right? And maybe we haven't measured them, maybe they're high frequency. So indeed, that is a, it, it's a very useful tool. It's not qualitative, it's, it's, it's very qualitative at this point. Uh, not quantitative, meaning, you know, we can't, I couldn't tell you the dipole moment to a tenth of a Dubai, but but indeed it 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 is a very useful capability. And it can be exploited for, can be exploited for good, frankly. So. All right, uh, uh, Rolf Kaiser has a, just a, a comment or an addition that um, um, he wants to point out that some very recent uh, astrochemical models of TMC1 are doing a, a, a better job of reproducing the abundances of aromatics with six-membered rings, although not ending. And there's a, a he lists a citation from a, a, a PCCP paper that was uh, published in just the last year. Mm, good, good game. Um, and then we have another question from um, Ernest Gargas, who has some more general questions about uh, molecular abundances uh, as related to the process of like star formation. Oh, sorry, uh, let me pull it back up again. So he wants to know uh, uh, to what extent we know what molecules are present during which stages of star formation, whether, you know, to what extent they tell us about the process of star formation and whether the distributions of molecules change over the course of star formation. That's, that is a lar large topic. 
which unfortunately we don't have, I mean, it, there are people obviously very much devoted to this, people interested in protoplanetary disks, for example, who have looked at, you know, the snow lines um, and how that can drive the chemistry. Um, I mean, there's a, it, it's hard to answer that question succinctly, I would say. Um, indeed, the more complex molecules become, the closer we think they are, you know, if to let's say from a primordial gas cloud to to what we to Earth, right? The, the generally, complexity, chemical complexity follows. So the more evolved the sources, generally speaking, the more complicated its chemistry. Um, again, there's a, many aspects about ion molecule reactions being very important in in diffuse clouds and in in molecules before stars formed when a star is formed. How that chemistry can ultimately uh, evolve. How Ice is formed. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's hard to answer that succinctly. I would say, but indeed, th there are many tracers that are used, and they often can provide information about the um, rough estimate of, of the ages as well. Yeah, well, I think we have uh, reached the top of the hour, which uh, uh, indicates that we're about out of time for today. So, um, thank you again, uh, Mike, uh, for that great talk, and thanks again, uh, uh, Josh. Uh, it was, uh, a really enjoyable uh, uh, astro seminar for me. Um, so again, uh, we'll be back uh, next month with another astro seminar. And uh, as just one last reminder, if you have someone who you think would be a great candidate for the ACS uh, Astrochemistry Dissertation Award, please do get those nominations into us by the end of the month. Uh, well, again, uh, Happy New Year. I hope uh, those of you in academia are off to a good start for your semesters. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully see you back here next month. Take care, everyone. <laughs>